it is the Lord. The disciples intuit and feel and know a presence familiar and yet strange. This has been the experience of the Christian centuries. We meet the same presence, but also manifestations of its power. The locus of encounter par excellence is the liturgical field. Why? It is the voice of the church. Heaven and earth are very close when the church is praying with the voice of Christ himself. Hence it is that nothing short of perfection is demanded when we execute materially what the angels execute spiritually next to us and in heaven. Hence it is that we find sometimes the frontiers very thin. Heaven and earth do intermingle in the liturgical sphere. Angels are coming and going. One element that invites interiority and encounter is beauty. Beauty specifically in sound. And we find that this too has had a border area where the beyond has broken through into the present. Strange examples we have in the annals of sanctity. One has to go but to the origins of the monastic life in the Egyptian desert. What does one find there? The ancient Agios, Sotios, Agios, Ischiros, Agios, Athanatos, Enais, Onimas, Holy God, Holy and Strong, Holy Mighty One, have mercy on us. Being heard, angels singing and transmitting some liturgical element which has remained in East and West to this day, for we have it on Holy Friday. We also have it recuperated in the Chapel of Divine Mercy, given precisely by heaven, in a country which is a bridge country between East and West, Poland. Well, things have happened here and there. We have the case of Blessed Peter of Gubbio in Umbria, a place dear to St. Francis. <coughs> He was a hermit of St. Augustine. He later became provincial of the Brictinian hermits of St. Augustine. Well, interest in this particular holy man increased greatly when suddenly something happened. It was reported that at his tomb this took place. Often, when the hermits had gathered for the night office, notice the liturgical context, a voice was heard chanting the alternate verses of the Te Deum. Now we know from St. Bernard that he was given an understanding from heaven of the great importance of the Te Deum, and it should be well executed. It is an angelic chant by its nature, and heaven and earth are very much united in its powerful poetic mystic elements. Never should we be distracted with the Te Deum. He was also shown how some angels have nothing to carry up in their accompanying of prayer because some of the monks would be distracted. Others were very content to have a lot to offer up. So an investigation proved the voice was proceeding from the tomb of this blessed, blessed Peter. Well, what did they do? The vault in which he was buried was opened. To the amazement of all present, his body was found in a kneeling posture, with the hands joined in prayer and the mouth wide open. Interesting. An indication of the importance of liturgical prayer 
even from the beyond. The incorrupt body was moved to a more honourable resting place, where it is said to have remained incorrupt. The wonder also attracted pilgrims, and many flocked to Gubbio to pray at the tomb. So the monastery of St. Augustine in Gubbio can prove by a great collection of documents contained in its archives that the voice of the Blessed was heard emanating from his tomb many years after his death, as testified and sworn to by many distinguished authorities of the order and the reports of many reliable witnesses. Going on a bit further in time, there's a certain blessed Eustochia Calafato. She died in 1485. So she had spent already 11 years as a poor Claire, and she was involved in the founding of a new convent. So by divine inspiration this took place and the original rule of St. Clair was to be observed in this from the beginning. Greater strictness, absolute poverty. So they found themselves at Monte Vergine in northeast Sicily. What happens here? We know of her heroic sanctity. She died a saintly death on January the 20th. Many miracles would happen through her, for instance, multiplication of food. But the most dramatic miracle of this Beata which so often protected the city from damaging earthquakes, remember Etna is always a threat down there in Sicily, occurred in 1615 when the city was shaken day and night by almost constant vibrations. Unable to quiet the earthquake by their own prayers, the Senate and people of the city petitioned the sisters to pray to Blessed Eustochia for protection. The sisters promised their prayers and then decided on a strange scenario. They removed the perfectly preserved body of the Blessed from the oratory that had been conserved for almost 150 years and placed it in an upright position in the saint's old choir store. Here we are, liturgical prayer once again. After they had charged Eustochia to pray for the protection of the city, the lips of the obedient Beata opened and her voice was heard chanting the first verse of the psalm of the night office. That will be Psalm 3, I believe. The sisters, completely terrified, nevertheless joined in the recitation and bowed their heads during the Gloria in unison with their holy founders. Needless to say, the earthquake is said to have ceased at that moment. Other things happen. We have the very puzzling case of Clelia Barbieri. She is a canonized saint and she is closer to us in time. She died in 1870. She united holy virgins around her and it became a congregation. She was regarded as a little angel from her earliest childhood. She had a magnetic attraction for other souls since she was able to regroup them. So, what happened? One day, while standing at the window of the community's house, she pointed to a nearby field and prophesied, Do you see that field next to the church? 
There the new house will rise. I will no longer be here. You will increase in number and will spread out on the plains and in the mountains to work in God's vineyard. Many will come with carriages and horses. So all that happened. Celia herself died of tuberculosis on July the 13th. She was only 23 years of age. Her last words were prophetic. Be brave, because I am going to paradise. But I shall always remain with you too. I shall never abandon you. This prophecy was also realised since she proved her presence by the sounding of her voice. The miraculous phenomenon of her voice first took place during the evening of July the 13th, 1871, exactly one year after Clelia's death. While the sisters were at prayer in the chapel, the sisters declared that suddenly there was the sound of a high-pitched, harmonious and heavenly voice that accompanied the singing in the choir. At times it sang solo, at others it harmonised with the choir, moving across from right to left. Sometimes it passed close by the ears of one or other of the sisters. The joy which it brought filled our hearts with a happiness impossible to put into words. This wasn't of this world. We lived that day in paradise. From time to time, one had to leave the room. The emotion that we experienced was so strong that it left you breathless until one had to call out, Enough, dear Lord, enough! But it didn't stop there. The miraculous event dismissed all thought of their night's rest. Instead, since the Blessed Sacrament was not then reserved in their chapel, they decided to pass the night adoring the Blessed Sacrament in a nearby church. They again declared, But how great was our surprise when we realised that the voice had followed us and accompanied us as we began our prayers. Clelia's voice prayed with them until dawn. Since that day, she has never left them, joining them in the most diverse surroundings and conditions. At the time of her death, there were only ten girls who lived in the community. After the rule of the order was approved by the Vatican, more members joined the community, many being inspired by the voice of the Holy Foundress. After the Second World War, there were 236 members. During the 1950s, the sisters numbered about 300, just under 300. In recent years, the flourishing order maintained over 35 institutions throughout Italy. Then mission fields beckoned, houses in Kerala and in Tanzania, with, of course, local women. In the communities of Usokami and Batacancheri, the sisters hear Clelia's voice, which sings and prays with them in Swahili and in Malayalam. When they pray in Latin, Clelia's voice prays in Latin as well. During the past 125 years since her death, Clelia's heavenly voice has been periodically heard in the houses of the order. Especially at La Buderie, the voice is heard accompanying the sisters in their hymns, in religious readings and in their conversations. It is also heard accompanying the priest during the celebration of Holy Mass and during the sermons. Even in the parish churches, 
it is heard lingering among the faithful. The mother superior of the order in the Bruderie stated to the author in 1970, this prodigious gift stimulates us to do well, increases our faith, is a relief to the trials of life, and gives us a desire for heaven. Here's a picture of a little lassie, an angel from heaven. There are other cases of a thin frontier with voices of saints, but let this suffice to remind us that when we're in a liturgical atmosphere, we are surrounded by invisible friends who expect only the best of us. Creating an atmosphere is a whole art. In it, God is well heard. We men must disappear. Over to you, Lord. This is your space, yours and that of your angels and saints. Yeah. Mm -hmm.